Well hello and welcome to our midweek study video for the week beginning June the 1st. If you haven't met me before, my name is Matt and I'm the curate in the Ely team. And during the coronavirus pandemic, we've been making these midweek videos to give individuals and home groups a chance to dig a little deeper into some of the themes and the questions that we've been exploring during our Sunday services. Most of you watching probably know how these videos work by now, but just to give you a heads up, during this video we'll start with a brief recap of the story of when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, which we looked at during our service last Sunday. And then I'll leave you with some questions to think through, either by yourself or with others. We'll then come back together and we'll try and apply what we've been thinking about to our lives. And finally, we'll finish our time together with an opportunity to pray deeper into some of the themes that have come up during the course of the video. So let's jump straight in today and get going by returning to Acts chapter 2, the passage that I preached on last Sunday. If you've got a Bible with you, you might like to find this passage now or read along on an app on your phone or tablet. And in this study, we're going to focus particularly on verses 1 to 13, which is slightly shorter than the reading we had on Sunday. We're going to listen to this passage being read now, and as you follow along and listen, I would encourage you to imagine how it must have felt to be the disciples on this day. So Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. As I've been thinking about Pentecost over the past few days, I've been reminded of this children's book that James often likes us to read to him. It's called The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story. Basically, it's all about a very tiny caterpillar who's born and how he eats many different types of food over the course of the week and gets very, very fat. This often causes great amusement to children as they see the different food that he eats. This is the caterpillar when he becomes nice and fat. And then when he's nice and fat, the caterpillar decides to make himself a special home called a cocoon. So he gets inside the cocoon and he stays there for two weeks. And then two weeks later, the book ends as the caterpillar nibbles a hole in his cocoon, pushes his way out and discovers that he's no longer a caterpillar, but actually a beautiful butterfly. And here's the beautiful butterfly that the caterpillar is transformed into at the end of the book. Well, over the past few days, I've been thinking quite a lot about this caterpillar. And I've realised that actually anybody who was looking on at the cocoon from the outside probably would have thought that nothing much was happening inside this cocoon. In fact, I'm sure that even the caterpillar himself probably didn't realise what was fully happening as he was inside the cocoon. But actually something amazing really was happening. The caterpillar was being transformed into a butterfly. He was literally growing wings, getting ready to take off and to soar into the air when he nibbled his way out. And in this passage from Acts chapter 2, I think that in some ways the disciples find themselves cocooned in and not really knowing what's going to happen next. At the beginning of the passage in verse 1, we read that all the disciples are together in one place and they're waiting. They're not really sure what they're waiting for, but nevertheless they're all together and they're waiting. All they know is that as Jesus ascended to heaven, he told them to wait for the Holy Spirit this is one of the last things that he told the disciples to do before he went back to his father. 
And if I belonged to this group of the disciples, I'm not sure that I would have been very impressed with this instruction from Jesus, probably because I'm absolutely terrible at waiting. When I sit still and I try and wait, I start to get stressed that the thing I'm waiting for will never actually happen. Or if I'm waiting for results, I manage to convince myself that the results will definitely be bad news. Or if somebody else has told me that they'll do something, I get stressed that they'll forget to do the one thing that they promised me that they would do. Waiting is very hard for me, and I'm sure for many people watching this video as well. And I bet the disciples found it hard to wait after Jesus ascended too. I bet they found it hard to keep trusting, to keep believing in Jesus' promises. It must have been hard to keep putting their lives on the line as they try to follow him and try to obey his command. But on this day of Pentecost, which was originally a Jewish festival for harvested crops, as the disciples continued to wait, the Holy Spirit did come upon them. Tongues of fire appeared on the disciples and they began speaking in other languages. It was as if they were leaving their cocoon and the disciples as the living and breathing church was just discovering their wings. As the disciples emerged speaking different languages, Jews who had gathered for the Pentecost festival were amazed to hear the wonderful things that God had done spoken in their own languages. The disciples are transformed as they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you go on to read beyond verse 13, you'll see that Peter, the disciple who previously always seemed to mess up and always said the wrong thing, the one who even denied that he knew Jesus three times as he was arrested, is now standing up and preaching an amazing sermon. It's so amazing, in fact, that we're told later on in verse 41 that 3,000 people joined the church after hearing about Jesus. Wow, Peter has definitely left his cocoon. He's found his wings and he is soaring as he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, all of us know in reality that Peter has taken a long time to get to this place, to come to this moment. Jesus promised him a long time ago that he would be the rock upon which his church would be built. But it would have taken Peter weeks and months, even years to build up to this moment. And I'm sure as Peter preached this sermon, he was thrilled to see the Holy Spirit working so powerfully through him and around him. But he would have known that the journey to this moment was just as important as Pentecost itself. Just as a butterfly can't soar into the air if it doesn't take the time to build itself a cocoon and grow wings, Peter had taken time to grow and to learn. He'd taken the time to grow and now he was soaring into his new role. And I think the same is true for us today. In moments of waiting, wrestling with God and asking difficult questions, it's important to realise that God is often just as powerfully at work as the days when we can obviously see the Holy Spirit poured out. Especially over the past few months, as many of us have been waiting, as many of us have been at home during the lockdown, working from home, waiting at home, wondering what's going to happen next at home. It's important to realise that if we invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill us, God can use our moments of waiting, our times of wrestling with him, our questions and our ups and downs to change us, to challenge us, to transform us into something beautiful, something that he can use for his purpose and for his glory. And on Sunday, I shared a few of the things that I felt God had been teaching me and changing inside of me over the past few weeks. And if you want to find out more about that, you can go back and listen to the service from Sunday and listen particularly to the sermon. But I wondered if during this midweek study, it might be helpful to explore a little bit more about what it means to trust that God is at work in us in those moments of waiting and to find actually some hope in the fact that whilst we are feeling like we're cocooned up, God isn't absent from our lives. Actually, he's transforming us and he can be getting us ready for all that he has in store for us in the future. So for now, I'm going to leave you with a few questions to explore either by yourself or in your home groups that pick up some of the themes that I've just raised. This week, I've split the questions up into four different areas of themes. So feel free to select the ones that seem most relevant or helpful to you. And please don't feel obliged to look at them all if they're not helpful. So the first theme is waiting and some questions around the theme of waiting. Do you find it easy or hard to wait for things to happen in life? What's the longest that you've ever had to wait for something? Has there been a time in your life when you've had to particularly wait upon God for something to happen or to change? The second theme I thought we could explore this week concerns the disciples and how they were feeling. So I wonder how do you think the disciples would have felt before the Holy Spirit arrived in verse 1 as they were together waiting? And how do you think they would have felt from verse 2 onwards as they were filled with the Holy Spirit? 
How would you have felt if you decided to not gather with the other believers on this particular day, but took your family to the beach instead, as you were fed up of waiting? The third theme this week that you can explore is all about the reactions of the different people in this story. So I wonder what would happen if you compared the reactions of the disciples in this passage to those of the crowd and also the mockers. What would that teach you about how people responded to the Holy Spirit at the time of Pentecost? And what do you think it can teach us about how people respond to the Holy Spirit today? And the fourth theme that you might want to explore concerns the theme of learning. What do you think God was teaching the disciples as they were gathered together? And do you think that God has been teaching you anything, especially during this unusual season of the coronavirus? So over to you. Do pause the video and do think through and discuss some of these questions. And when you're done, click play and I'll be here waiting for you. Well, welcome back. I hope that you found that time reflecting helpful, whether it was by yourself or with other people in your home group or household. In this second part of the video, we've often been looking at stories or testimonies that relate to the Bible passage that we've been exploring. And today we're going to take a similar but also slightly different approach. I want to show you a short clip which has been put together by Jill Duff, the Bishop of Lancaster. This was a message that was originally recorded by Bishop Jill to be sent out to all the churches in the Diocese of Blackburn. And I realise that most people watching this video this week will be tuned in from the Diocese of Ely and not Blackburn. But actually these words are very powerful and I think that they could actually inspire us today to seek God as we stop, we look and we listen to see how he's at work in our lives. So over to Bishop Jill. We are at a crossroads. This is the first time in history, Old Testament, New Testament, that our world has come to a stop with a global pandemic. We have been brought to a standstill at the crossroads. What does it mean to stop, look and listen for God's direction? As the lockdown eases, as the traffic lights turn to amber, what is God saying? I think he's saying three things. Wake up, repent, come home. Firstly, wake up. It's as if for a number of generations, the airwaves have been jammed over our nation. People's hearing and seeing has been dulled, but today I think the data is that people are hearing more than ever before. Selfishness has become socially unacceptable. Community spirit is alive and well, clapping out NHS workers. Captain Tom is our hero. A Sabbath for the environment. A great awakening of poetry and song. I don't know if you've seen the poem, The Great Realisation, which has gone viral on YouTube. People are asking about the big questions in life, waking up to what really matters. And people are facing death without the source of life, and they're afraid. The claims of the gospel are making more sense than ever before. Second thing he's saying, I think, is repent. This is not a word that translates very well in today's culture. It conjures up the man with a placard on the street <laughs> saying, repent, the end is nigh. So how about turn around, do a U-turn, do, do a U I think God is inviting us to stop and, and make a U-turn. Start again, look up. He wants to break the power of sin in our lives. And he's asking us as a, actually as a church, as Christians, to repent because judgment begins with the household of God. Repent of what? Well, ask him and I'm sure he'll show you. But it's funny how through history this word repent keeps going out of fashion. And yet it was the very word that Jesus used as a gateway to his kingdom. Today we might want to say, make a U-turn, turn around. And I'm asking the Spirit to give his translation for today so people can encounter the power of Jesus who rescues us from those corners we paint ourselves into, even the darkest corners of hell. Martin Luther said this, whatever you trust and rely upon, that is properly your God. What are our idols today? What do we trust and rely upon? Well, here's the number one suspect. Money. Jesus is very blunt. Two years ago, Archbishop Justin wrote his first book called Reimagining Britain, Foundations for Hope. And he put his finger on the only alternative God that Jesus names. The God of mammon, the God of money. You cannot serve both God and money. Could you see that mammon is wonderfully deceptive he is brilliant at squeezing out the poor, leaving our children on our estates without food. Health warnings are all over scripture 
and Christian history, and a priority in our early church was remember the poor. When Jesus sent out his disciples, he told them to travel light, to attach yourself to your possessions. What if in our shaking as a church, we lose so much excess baggage that weighs us down for being nimble on our feet with the gospel running shoes of Jesus? And then thirdly, I think the word I perhaps hear most strongly at the moment is the words, come home. This is Matthew chapter nine. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. As I pray, I just see lots of huddled sheep scattered across our nation with no shepherd, terrified. And sometimes I feel it to the point of tears, really. And in, in the passage of this word compassion, it doesn't mean never have a cup of tea. It means like gut twisting agony, like a howling in the heart of God. It's the same word we get in Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son. When the father saw the son, his heart was filled with compassion and he ran. I think there's an incredible agony in the heart of God for his lost sons and daughters, who he's longing to come back home. And the agony is so intense, it's forcing its way into our culture. It's in our films, for example, both the last Star Wars films, Han Solo pleads with his estranged son, Kylo Ren. We miss you, please come home. It's in our marketing, Ikea sell you a happier life at home. Right move will help you find your forever home. God has put this longing for our home in the hearts of his children. And in this crisis, we're starting to tune in and hear. Have you spotted the UK blessing song on YouTube? One million views in 24 hours. We are waking up to his peace from heaven, the peace that passes all understanding. And I am praying, I'm begging God that he does the impossible, that in this crisis, he gives birth to sons and daughters born of the spirit, born um, uh, children of the promise, born in impossibility, and that we as a church are there to catch them when they're born and help feed them and grow them into maturity. What is the spirit of Jesus saying to our nation? With all the agony of the Father, heart of God, with tears running down his face, running towards his lost sons and daughters. He is sobbing from the heart. I miss you. Please come home. We're at the crossroads now. Let's listen to the heart of God for Lancashire and for our nation. Amen. I hope that you found those words as encouraging as I did. I'm particularly encouraged by those three themes that Bishop Jill shared with us, waking up, repenting and coming home. And later on in our final part of the video, there'll be a chance to pray through these themes in more depth. But just for a minute or two, I wonder if you might be willing to pause this video and reflect on whether one or two of those themes has particularly resonated with you over the past few weeks, or whether one of those themes is resonating with you today. Or if none of the themes that Bishop Jill raised in the video seem relevant, why not take a moment to just reflect on the past few weeks and to see if there's something else that God has been speaking to you about. When you've had a minute or two to think and to reflect, I'd encourage you to share your thoughts with others if you're engaging with this study as a home group. Or if you're working through the study by yourself, why not write down the theme that you've been reflecting on and anything else that comes to mind during your time of being still? I often think it's good to try and name how God seems to be speaking and teaching us so that at a later date when we have questions or doubts or just simply feel discouraged, we can go back to the person we shared with or the note that we wrote to find encouragement and hope for the future from what we've been learning and writing about in the past. So I'll pray a short prayer for us and then I'd encourage you to spend a few minutes reflecting on those themes of waking up, repenting and coming home as Bishop Jill shared in her clip and then any other theme that you might find comes to mind as you think back on today or the past few weeks. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for your presence with us today and always. As we give you these next few minutes of our time, we pray that you would help us to think back on all that has happened in the last few months and to try and understand how you might have been at work in our lives. Holy Spirit, come and fill us now, we pray. Amen. So as we come to the final section of our study video today, we're going to take those three themes from Bishop Jill's video, waking up, repenting and coming home to direct our prayers today. 
So first of all, a prayer centred around the words, wake up. And we're going to take some words from Isaiah chapter 60, just to centre our thoughts as we pray around this theme. Isaiah tells God's people to arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And so, Father God, as we reflect back over the past few months, we acknowledge that it has at times felt like we've been walking in dark and challenging times. And we also admit that all of us have experienced times when we've struggled with the impact of COVID-19 and the way that that has changed our normal lives. In amongst our confusion and our grief and our questioning, we ask, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on your church so that we may see you more clearly, love you more dearly and follow you more nearly. And we pray especially for our city and our nation too, that in amongst the darkness and the questions that many may be facing at this time, your glory, Lord, would appear over those who are struggling. We pray that this nation and its leaders would come into the brightness of your dawn and discover your love, which has the power to transform everything. Amen. So as we move now on to the theme of repentance, another verse from Psalm 51 to focus our thoughts. David writes, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broke and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So we pray, Father God, the one Father of each and of us all. As we reflect on the last few weeks, we confess to you the times when we have disobeyed your will, those moments when we've forgotten you or left you out of our lives. We are very sorry for the times when we have been blind to our sins and the times when we've been too proud to admit our sins to you and too indifferent to make amends. We come before you, Father, and ask for your forgiveness. Give us honest, humble and penitent hearts and help us to know your spirit at work in us today, drawing us into your love. For the sake of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And finally, we reflect for a few moments on the words, Come home. And here's that verse we heard earlier from Matthew 9:36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd and we thank you for your willingness to lay down your life to protect your sheep. We thank you too for your compassion for each of us. Thank you that you love us more than we could ever begin to imagine. Please help us today to know that love in amongst all that we're facing and carrying at this moment. Please help us to know that you are here with us and you care deeply for us. And we pray especially today for all those we know in our families, amongst our friends and work colleagues, and in our wider community who don't yet know your love. Help us, Lord, to have the same compassion on them as you did. And please pour out your spirit on those we especially hold in our hearts and minds at this time. May they find their way home into your perfect and unfailing love. Amen. And normally at the end of our midweek videos, I would end with a prayer of blessing. But this week, I'm actually going to show you another video clip, which many of you might have already seen. It's called The Blessing. And it's a collection of worship leaders from churches around the UK singing a prayer of blessing over the UK during this season. As we finish our study tonight, I would encourage you to receive these words that are being sung for you and your friends and your family. May you know God's blessing. May you know him keeping you steadfast. And may you see his face in the next week. Amen. Shine
upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. from heaven this isn't second guessing we know that we are protected may the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message grace and favors in your nature in your essence may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand Oh, right. 